Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. Anybody glad to be in church this morning? Are you glad to be in church? I'm so glad to hear that. Why don't you stand up? It's so good to be together this morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to rejoice and be glad in it. So I know you're thankful for the day the Lord's given you, and it's a day that we need to give back to Him, okay? So we're going to give Him praise. We're going to lift up His name. And one way we do that is to lift our voices and sing, all right? And this says that this is the house of the Lord, and it's a house of joy. You ready? So let's sing it together. Lift your voice. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Hey, while you're standing, why don't you take a second and greet somebody. Share that joy, all right? Just, just take a second and say hello to somebody next to you.
says over a thousand tongues to sing his praise. So let's do that right now. You ready? Lift it up. You can be seated. Thank you. 
think you need it, but let's step up there anyway. Hey, everybody, good to see you this morning. This is Blaze Tracy. Blaze is eight years old for about, oh, I don't know, 15 or 16 more hours. Her birthday is tomorrow, and so she'll be nine years old tomorrow. She will be a third grader at Merrill Hyde. She enjoys uh, art, and she likes soccer, and she's looking forward to school starting. She said she wants to see her friends, so she's looking forward to that uh, happening. She recently uh, asked Jesus into her heart. She went through our new Christians class. We want children to understand what that means and not just be baptized because someone else was baptized. We want them to understand that. She has an older uh, sister and an older brother. Her parents are here in the back with me. Uh, any other family members here with her today? R right on the front row. You got them on the front row, Blaze. Way to go. All right, Blaze, I'm gonna ask you to turn like this. And I'm going to ask you to tell everybody who is Jesus to you. He's my Lord and Savior. Then, Blaze Tracy, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Got it? And happy birthday, Blaze. Miss Melanie, come over there and step up on that one. You probably don't need it either, but that'll help people see you better. This is Melanie Gossett and her dad, Chad. Her mom, uh, Rachel, is also in the back. I, I didn't say um, the Tracy's names. Brad and, and Rachel were in the back there as well. But um, Melanie's mother's in the back. Her dad's standing here with her. She has two siblings as well. She has an older sister and a younger sister. And she also is a third grader. She's going to be... Uh, in the third grade this year up at Community uh, Christian School. That's up in White House. And she, I asked both of them if they were looking forward to school starting. One was and one wasn't. <laughs> I'll let you figure out which. She enjoys rollerblading and uh, just, uh, she just enjoys life. She's very active in our church here. And I am delighted that she has asked Jesus into her heart. And by the way, I'm delighted that both of these girls, uh, they don't normally attend this worship service, but they asked me to do their baptism. And this is the only time of the day that I can because of my schedule. So I'm honored that you asked me to do this, Melanie. Thank you very much. So tell everybody out there, who is Jesus to you? My Lord and Savior. All right, turn that way and grab my arm. And I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Got it? We began the service singing, There's Joy in the House of the Lord, and that's the reason there's joy in the house of the Lord. It's wonderful to see uh, these young people accept Christ early in their life. They have their whole life to live for him and to make a difference uh, for Jesus Christ. Um, hope you will pray for Blaze and Melanie this morning that God will just bless them as they begin their disciple walk with Jesus Christ. Uh, tomorrow it's going to be an interesting day in that a lot of boys and girls, just like Melanie and Blaze, are headed to camp. It's time for our children's camp this coming week. We only have about 253 of them going up to Campbellsville, Kentucky, and they're going to have an incredible, incredible time. Uh, we're going to be praying for them that uh, God is going to touch many of their hearts and lives, and uh, many of them, they will come home different than when they left. Last night, it, as I was thinking about this, uh, last night was the 55th birthday of my spiritual life. I came to know Christ 55 years ago last night at a children's camp. And so I've just been praying that God is going to touch many of these children's lives. And who knows? 55 years from today, there may be one of those boys and girls that are standing up here on this platform leading in praise team or uh, 
serving in the choir, the orchestra, maybe even one of them's going to be a pastor one day. But we're praying that God's going to bless him in a very special way. It's also a, a special week. All month long, we've had mission teams that have been coming and going. Uh, we have a group that uh, is in Alaska. Uh, they got there late last night. They're starting this morning working uh, First Baptist Anchorage, Alaska. I have a group of college students that are in Hawaii. They'll be working in a vacation Bible school in a church there uh, this week. Uh, teaching boys and girls. I uh, had a group get into uh, Latvia late, uh, early this morning, actually, uh, and they're going to be serving uh, Russian speaking uh, immigrants in Latvia. And uh, let's see, I think we've got one other group. Oh, the middle school group. We have 30 middle schoolers that are leaving tomorrow morning. They'll be working with World Changers, 30 middle schoolers up at Radcliffe, Kentucky. So we have a lot of groups that will be out this week. We're going to be praying that God's going to use them in a special, special way. If you're a guest, we welcome you to First Baptist Hendersonville. It's our prayer that the Lord is going to just reveal himself to you in a very special way today, and you'll experience his presence. At the end of the service, Pastor Chester and I are going to be out in the foyer. Please come by. Let us say thank you for being here today. Uh, we want to meet you this morning. Let's bow together. Uh, we have the incredible privilege of prayer. God has given us uh, the ability for each one of us to go directly to him. Would you take just a moment and you just spend a moment with him? Perhaps we want to just thank him for him the blessings of this past week. We sang all of my life, God has been good. Express gratitude for that. Would you lift up a prayer for Blaze and for Melanie that God will bless them as they begin their Christian walk? then ask the Lord to speak to you this morning as if no one else was in the room this morning just you and the Lord speak directly to you Lord you've heard our prayers we look forward to how you're going to answer through Christ Jesus amen
thankful for how great our God is. Jesus is greater. I, I've, I've been reflecting on the pastor's message from last week. Satan is, is strong, but Jesus is stronger. Amen. And I'm thankful today that we serve that kind of God. Sing this hymn with us. Uh, there's so many things about him that are greater. And this is the hymn that I love. Sing with us. Marvelous grace of our seated. The song we sing right now is one that if you've been in this church a long time, you know it well. But I was thinking about his grace, his love, all of these things that are endless that God provides. And regardless of what life throws us, I'm thankful that we have a foundation. I'm thankful that we have an anchor.
by faith alone, sight unknown, and yet his eyes were watching me. As always, thank you, choir and orchestra. Joe, thank you for what a wonderful, wonderful song. 
Well, I said something about Blaze's family, but I think I forgot to ask about Melanie's family. So all of you in Melanie's family, wave over here. Melanie, look around and see all your family there. I'm sorry, I forgot that earlier. Well, take your Bible and find Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, we've come to a pretty interesting passage here. All passages are interesting, but this one uh, is unusual a little bit. It's just a short passage that I'm going to read in a moment. Just to remind you, uh, Jesus just healed a person. Now, they're already watching him. They're trying to see if they can catch him saying something or doing something that they can use to have him arrested. And he healed a man who was a mute, and uh, Jesus explained that... There was a demon inside of him that was mute, and when Jesus cast out the demon, the man could speak. And so they accused him of doing that through the power of Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub is a synonym for the devil. They said he did it through the power of the devil. The passage we studied last week, just preceding this, Jesus dealt with that, and he showed the fallacy of the way that they were thinking. But one of the things that they said during that inter exchange was they demanded a sign. They wanted a sign. So now Jesus is going back into their history. Let me just kind of give you a, a, a little synopsis of what this passage I'm about to read says, and then I'll read it, and you see if, if that is indeed what it says. Basically, Jesus went back into their history, and he pulled out two individuals. He pulls out Jonah, and he pulls out Solomon, two that, was, that were very important in their Jewish history, and he used them as examples, and he said, now these two men, Jonah and Solomon, served as examples or signs for their generation. And their generation came to God as a result of that. And one day, because you are not seeing a sign that has been given to you that is even greater than the sign they had, you are not seeing the sign that God has given to you. One day they are going to rise up, and one day those generations are going to condemn you because even though they had a great sign, you have an even greater sign, and you're not paying attention to it. That's what he says. Now, let's read it, just four verses. Let's read it and see if, in fact, that's what this passage says. Beginning in verse 29 of Luke chapter 11. It says, as the crowds were increasing, he began saying, this generation is an evil generation. It demands a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The queen of the south, he's going to, I'll show you in a moment, that's the queen of Sheba. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with men of this generation and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at Jonah's proclamation and look, Something greater than Jonah is here. What Jesus was saying was Jonah was great and Solomon was great, but Jesus was saying, I am better. What you have is a sign that is the greatest sign that's ever been given. Now, what I want to do today is that this is just important when you read something like that to go back and see the, the history of what it's talking about. So I want to do two things today. Let's jump back, first of all, to the book of Jonah. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because you know this story so well. You know that God called Jonah to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was in what is today Iraq. So it was 500 miles to the east. And that's where God told Jonah to go. But Jonah did just the opposite. Instead of going 500 miles to the east, he went 2,000 miles to the west. He went as far as he could go in the known world at that time. He went to a place that the Bible calls Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is on the other end of the Mediterranean. It, it is just before you go out into the Atlantic. It's as far as they could go in their world. It is in what today we know as Spain, and it is very near Gibraltar. If you've ever been to Gibraltar, you've been near Tarshish, and that's where Jonah went, 2,500 miles away from where God told him to go. And you know the story. The storm comes, and the, 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 the crew begins to jettison everything they can. Jonah confesses. He says, I'm running from God. This is my fault, and the only way you're going to be saved is to throw me overboard. And they, they did that. They threw him off the ship, and God sent, a, we say Jonah and the whale. The Bible says God sent a big fish, 
And, and I remind you that the big fish wasn't sent to punish Jonah. The big fish was Jonah's salvation. Had the big fish not shown up, Jonah would have drowned out in the middle of the Mediterranean. God sent the fish to save Jonah. The fish, in a, in a sense, is a symbol of the salvation that God sends to us through Jesus Christ. He rescues us. Uh, we who are perishing, we've been rescued through the blood of Jesus. And we know that uh, the, the fish swallowed Jonah. He spent three days in his belly. He repented. He said he would go to Nineveh. The fish regurgitated him up onto the shore. He did go to Nineveh. He did preach the word, and many of the Ninevites were saved. Now, what do you learn from Jonah? I'm going to move on to Solomon very quickly. I want to spend our time there. But what do you learn from Jonah? There, let me tell you three or four things. One is you can run from God, but you can't hide. You can run from God, but he knows where you are, and when he has called you to do something, you can run from God, but you cannot hide. The second thing you learn from Jonah is that sometimes God uses adversity to get our attention. Sometimes things happen in our life, and it causes us to slow down a little bit. We've thought we're too important. We've thought we're too busy. We thought we don't have time for God or the things of God, and sometimes God will use adversity to get your attention. A third thing you learn from Jonah is that God does give us oftentimes second chances. Not always, but God oftentimes does give us second chances. And then the fourth thing you learn from Jonah is if you're obedient, if you do what God tells you to do, if you go where God tells you to go, he will bless that and he will bless you and the end result will be better than the first. Now, those are all things you learn from Jonah. And Jesus said that the generation of Jonah had a sign. God used Jonah as a sign and they repented. And you've got a greater sign. Jesus is greater than Jonah. But then he talks about Solomon. Now, you can, you can read about Solomon both in 2 Chronicles and first Kings. I'm going to start, and you might want to follow me in some of the passages I'm going to point out today. You might not. You might just want to jot them down. You may just want to listen, but I'll tell you where I'm reading. I want to show you several things about Solomon. Now, I'm starting in first Kings chapter 10, and this, is, this kind of explains what Jesus said in Luke 11. So listen, beginning in verse 1, it says, the queen of Sheba. Now, the queen of Sheba is that queen of the south that Luke was talking about, and, and Sheba, the queen of Sheba, was as far south in Arabia as a person could go. We know it today as Yemen. It is modern-day Yemen, and so the, it, it's far away from Israel. The queen of Sheba heard about Solomon's fame, connected with the name of Yahweh, and came to test him with difficult questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very large entourage, with camels bearing spices, gold in great abundance, and precious stones. She came to Solomon and spoke to him about everything that was on her mind. So Solomon answered all of her questions. Nothing was too difficult for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba observed all of Solomon's wisdom, the palace he had built, the food at his table, his servant's residence, his attendant's service, their attire, his cupbearers, the burnt offerings he offered in the Lord's temple, it took her breath away. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your words and your wisdom is true, but I didn't believe the reports until I came and saw it with my own eyes. Indeed, I was not even told half. Your wisdom and prosperity far exceed the report I heard. How happy are your men. How happy are these servants of yours who always stand in your presence hearing your wisdom. May Yahweh your God be praised. He delighted in you and he put you on the throne of Israel because the Lord's, because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel. He has made you king to carry out justice and righteousness. Now, that's what this passage that Jesus just spoke of in Luke 11, that's what this is about, when the queen of Sheba came to see Solomon. Now, Jesus said, Solomon is great. And I just read that passage where Sheba said that when she saw all of the things that he had, when she saw all the things he built, when she heard all the things he said, she said that it took her breath away. Now, I want you to think with me for just a few minutes about the greatness of Solomon. Jesus said Solomon was great, and then he said, I am greater. He said, the one that has come to you is greater. So I want us to kind of dissect that a little bit, think about that just a little bit. So let's start with this question. How was Solomon great? I think you already know the answer to that question, but let me just point out several things. First of all, he was great in wisdom. He had wisdom beyond anyone else. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse 29. 
1 Kings 4.29 says, God gave Solomon wisdom, very great insight and understanding, as vast as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all of the people of the east, greater than all of the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone. His reputation extended to all of the surrounding nations. Solomon composed 3,000 proverbs. His songs numbered 1,005. He described trees from the cedars in Lebanon to the hyssop growing out of the wall. He taught about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. People came from everywhere sent by every king on earth who had heard of his wisdom to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Solomon was the wisest person who had ever lived. And if you go back to chapter 3 of 1 Kings, you remember when God said to Solomon, I'm going to give you anything you ask for. Ask for anything you want and it'll be yours. Now, most of us would have asked for wealth and maybe fame. Solomon asked for wisdom, and God was so impressed by the request that Solomon had, he said, I'll not only give you the wisdom that you've asked for, but I'm going to give you all of the other things as well that you didn't ask for. Now, Jesus said Solomon is great, and, and he is. I mean, when you look at Scripture, much of the Old Testament, what they knew as Scripture, we have the New Testament, but much of what they knew as Scripture, Solomon wrote much of it. I mean, the first five books Moses wrote, David wrote, wrote a lot of the Psalms, but think about what all Solomon wrote. He wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. He wrote the Song of Solomon. So Solomon wrote the Word of God. He was great because he wrote the Word of God. Now, how could Jesus be greater than that? Well, here it is. Solomon wrote the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word... Became, and, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory. Solomon is great in his wisdom, but Jesus was greater. Solomon wrote the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. But Solomon was also great in his buildings. Now let me show you some passages about that. Go over to Second Chronicles if you want to, or just jot it down if you don't want to turn to it. But... 2 Chronicles chapter 8 talks about all of the things that Solomon built. And he was the greatest builder in Jewish history. He built his own personal palace. He built the temple. By the way, did you know that the temple took seven years to build? 183,000 workers on the temple. For seven years, six days a week. I looked up just out of curiosity. I looked up the world's largest building and I Googled and asked how many people worked on that building. And it was, I believe it was 12,000 people worked on the, on the world's tallest building. And the Bible says that 183,000 workers built the temple and it took them seven years to do it. He built the temple. He built his palace. He built kingdoms. Uh, across his entire reign. He was the greatest builder in their history. This is what Scripture says about him in Second Chronicles chapter 8. At the end of 20 years, during which Solomon had built the Lord's temple in his own palace, Solomon had rebuilt the cities Hiram gave him and settled Israelites there. Solomon went to Hamath Zobah and seized it. He built Tadmor in the wilderness along with the storage cities that he built in Hamath. He built up Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon. He fortified cities with walls and gates and bars, Baalath, all the storage cities that belonged to Solomon, all the chariot cities, the cavalry cities, everything Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, Lebanon, or anywhere else in the land of his dominion. Solomon was the greatest builder that they knew when Jesus said Solomon was great he knew what he was talking about now how does Jesus compare with that well Jesus said on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it you know what Jesus said in John chapter 14 he said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I'm going to go to prepare another word for that is to build I'm going to go and build a place for you and if I go and build a place for you, I'll come again and receive him myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Solomon made a lot of things, but those things have come and gone. Jesus built things that are eternal. Jesus built his church, and Jesus has built a heavenly home. Jesus said, Solomon is great, but the one who has come to you is greater. But it's not only his wisdom and his, his building. The Bible also says that he is... 
He is... Um, he was great in the sacrifices that he made. Turn back. I, I, I guess it's just one page. If you're there, it's Second Chronicles 8. Go back to Second Chronicles 7. And the Bible talks about all of the sacrifices that Solomon made. Uh, you know, he built the temple. He built it on what was Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was where Abraham had taken Isaac, willing to sacrifice him to be obedient to the Lord. It was there at the peak of Mount Moriah where the temple was built, and Solomon began making sacrifices there in, in the temple. This is what the Bible says in verse 4, 2 Chronicles 7, 4. The king and all the people were offering sacrifices in the Lord's presence. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep. In this manner, the king and all the people dedicated God's kingdom. Can you imagine that? Where did they store 22,000 cows and 120,000 sheep? Now, how in the world with that great sacrifice, that was just at the dedication of the temple. That doesn't include everything else that Solomon sacrificed throughout his life. How in the world could you say that Jesus was greater when Solomon made all of those sacrifices to God? Well, Solomon might have sacrificed 120,000 lambs, but I'm telling you, Jesus is the Lamb of God who came to be the sacrifice for our sins. Once and for all, Jesus made a sacrifice that would never have to be made again. Solomon was great. That's what he was saying. That's what Jesus was saying. Solomon was great. You want a sign? Solomon was great, but Jesus is greater. He was greater in wisdom. He was greater in construction, in the building. He was greater in sacrifices. He, he, was, he was greater in wealth. Now, uh, Sheba, the queen of Sheba mentioned that in the passage that I read there in 1 Kings 10 a minute ago. She said, it took my breath away. But listen to what else that passage says. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches and wisdom. The whole world wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God put in his heart. Every man would bring his annual tribute, items of silver and gold and clothing and weapons and spices and horses and mules. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, and he stationed them in the chariot cities with the king of Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedar as abundant as sycamore in the Judean foothills. Solomon's horsemen were imported from Egypt and Kew. The king's traders brought them from Kew at the going price. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 15 pounds of silver and a horse for about four pounds. In the same way, they exported them to all of the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of Aram throughout the ages. There was no one as wealthy as Solomon. Now, how can you say that Jesus, who didn't even own a house, how can you say that Jesus, who... Scripture says he had no place to lay his head. How can you say that Solomon, with all of his wealth, how can you say that Jesus was greater than Solomon? Well, I can tell you how. Psalms chapter 50 says that the Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't, it doesn't say he owns a thousand cattle on the hills. It says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalm 26 says the earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. It all belongs to him. Everything that Solomon had made him great, but what Scripture says is that Jesus is greater. Listen to this in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 7 says, We have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians chapter 2 says, So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Solomon was rich. Jesus was richer. Now, the last thing to say about Solomon is that he had great influence. I mean, you think about the influence of Solomon. He controlled what we know as Israel and Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. He controlled, and he could have controlled any part of the world that he wanted to control. Solomon was the most influential man in his world. But I'm telling you that Jesus is more influential I was a little curious about that this week, so I Googled. You do this when you get home. I Googled just who is the most influential person in the history of the world. 
And you know almost every single list that came up. There were one or two exceptions out of dozens of lists that I, that I read through. There were a couple of exceptions that were lists made by people that were so liberal that they wouldn't acknowledge anything about God. But almost every list, the number one person listed as the most influential person in the history of the world is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, what's the so what? Well, what does all this say to us? What are you supposed to take away from this? Well, here, here it is. This is the so what. Solomon was wise, and Solomon was the greatest builder, and Solomon was rich. Solomon was influential. All of those things are absolutely true. Solomon reigned for 40 years, but just a few years after his death, his kingdom split. And that great palace that Solomon built, we don't even know where it is or where it was. Don't even know where the ruins of Solomon's palace, where it might have been located. The temple, it's gone. The Romans destroyed it. All of the wealth that he had, it's no more. But what about Jesus? What about that man that was born to an obscure peasant woman? Spent the first 30 years of his life as a carpenter? He only ministered for three years. Think about that for a moment. Just let that sink in. He only ministered for three years. He never, never did any of the things that we think of as making someone great. He never ran for public office. He never wrote a book. He was never on any radio station or television show. He didn't have any T-shirts that he sold. He didn't even get anything from the what would Jesus do stuff that's out there today. Three years. When the tide of popular opinion turned against him and they crucified him, it was a friend who took pity on him and gave him a tomb, a borrowed tomb in which he could be buried. Truth is, Jesus wasn't going to use it but three days and he could give it back to him. He didn't need it very long. The poet who wrote that poem that you've read many times, One Solitary Life, concluded those thoughts with this statement. He said, 19 centuries have come and gone. Today we would say 20 centuries have come and gone. And today he, Jesus, is still the cornerstone of the human race, the centerpiece of the human race, the leader of the column of progress. He said, I'm well within the mark when I say all of the armies that ever marched all of the navies that ever sailed, all of the parliaments that ever sat, all of the kings that ever reigned have not affected life on this earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. Jesus lived three years and died. And not a day goes by, not a continent on earth where his name is not spoken. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is Lord. The Jews said, we want a sign. Give us a sign. Jesus said, you want a sign? The people of Jonah's day wanted a sign and the people of Solomon's day wanted a sign and everybody's wanted a sign. But I'm telling you that the greatest sign you could ever have is here with you today. So it's the same question I ended with last week. What do you do with Jesus? That's really the heart of the matter. It's the most important question you can ever answer. What do you say about Jesus? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if you'll follow him, he will bless you throughout eternity. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the passage that reminds us that there's some great, great people in the Old Testament, Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jonah and Solomon and David. But when you spoke through your son Jesus, you said it all. When you sent Jesus, you sent us the greatest sign of your love and your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness that we could ever receive. 
And I pray for someone today who's just kind of been floating through life and they've never really dealt with the question of what do you say about Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? Someone here today needs to do what two little girls did this morning, what two third graders did when they stood in front of a congregation and said, Jesus is my Lord. And I pray for someone today who needs to make that same confession of faith in their life. There's a 48-year-old that needs to do what an 8-year-old did. There's a 68-year-old that needs to do what an 8-year-old did. They need to publicly confess that Jesus is Lord. He gave his all for me, and for 20 centuries, he has been the most influential person who ever lived, and it will always be that way. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would leave here today more committed to following Jesus than we've ever been. He is greater, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song. Pastor Bruce and I are waiting. We'd love to help you become a part of this church. Come let us help you do that. You come here every week, but you've never really kind of made it official. Let us help you do that. Some of you need to, somebody needs to be baptized. We can help you with that. Somebody may just have a burden on your heart. We stand down here because we want to pray for you and with you. If you'll come to us, we'd love to pray for you. Jason, lead us in a song. Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. Jason. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Pastor and I will be out in the foyer. If you have a spiritual decision to make or prayer need, we would love to visit with you and pray with you uh, at, the, at the conclusion uh, of the service. I want to encourage you, if you're not in a connect group, this is a great day to be engaged in one out at the Welcome Center or some people that would love to show you uh, to a great Bible study group. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you. Jason, let's close. Sing House of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Sing it. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. God bless you. You're dismissed.